everyone, my name is Grace Kessler. I'm a debater at Emory University, and today I'm going to be giving you all a lecture on being neg against an unfamiliar AF. I've included my email below, so if you have any questions about the lecture or debate, don't hesitate to reach out. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. So for a bit of context for this lecture, what I mean by being neg against an unfamiliar AF is kind of think about those debates where before the debate, you go up to your opponents and you ask them what the AF is going to be, they tell you what it is, but you're not very familiar with it. You've never maybe debated this before. You don't have a case neg necessarily. You're just a bit nervous because you feel like they have more experience on this AF and you've never really debated it before. So that's kind of the context for what I'm going to be talking about. I'm gonna talk about strategies for before the round and preparing the one in C. I'm gonna talk about strategies for cross X and I'm gonna talk about what you can do, what you can do during the debate to maximize your chances of winning and addressing kind of the concerns and the fear that come with debating arguments that you're not very familiar with. So first, before the round and while you're preparing the one in C and kind of preparing your strategy for the debate, it's important to ask yourself a couple of relevant questions. So just from a basic perspective, what does this AF say? What are its advantages? And what am I the least familiar with? So identifying you know, arguments that you've encountered before that the affirmative team is going to bring up versus arguments you've never encountered before. Um, even just from a more basic perspective, looking up terms that you're unfamiliar with, those are all ways that you can, or doing that is a way that you can really leverage your time before the round um, to be most productive given that you're kind of unfamiliar with what this AF is. It's important to just kind of try to go back to the basics and understand it um, from a fundamental level in terms of what the AF is suggesting um, and what the advantages are that you're going to have to respond to. Um, this is important in all debates, but you should try to think backwards. So figure out where you're going to go for in the two in R and then figure out the block and then figure out the one in C, I think is the best way to develop next strategy in debates. So when I say figure out what you want to go for in the two in R, that doesn't mean you pick one disad or a topicality argument and you're like, no matter what, this is what the two in R is going to focus on. Because what if the affirmative team severely mishandles another argument, or you feel like they're actually kind of beating you on what you wanted to go for in the two and R? You obviously have to be adaptable and be prepared to change your strategy a bit during the debate based on what the other team says. But it's important whenever you're addressing an affirmative to think what is the winning two and R against this? What disad is the most persuasive? Maybe what do we have the most evidence on? Um, those are some of the questions that you should be asking and answering before the debate and as the one you see is kind of being read. Something that's really important to do, especially in these debates, is see what generics apply. By generics, I mean positions that can be read against any affirmative, given that it's going to be topical, um, and an example of the resolution. So on the water topic, um, you all went for, it seems like the business confidence disad and the federalism disad a lot. Those are examples of generic disads because they generally link to all the different affirmatives that could possibly re be read. So a team though might read an AF against you where you don't have any specific links, but that's not the end of the world because at least, like I said, if they're an example of the resolution, then you can read generic links about like on last year's topic, changing water policy. Um, and you can try to think about how to contextualize it to the AF, even if you're not reading specific evidence. So you can, you know, it's always best to have specific evidence and always, you know, the best to have a case neg against all different affirmatives, but sometimes you're not going to, and that's okay. And that's why you have generic links and generic positions that you can then during the debate contextualize to the specific affirmative that is being read against you. Another piece of advice is to ensure that you're answering the case. By this, I mean, make sure that you're pressing affirmative <clears throat> solvency, you're answering their advantages, because sometimes whenever you're not as familiar with an AF, it's easy to neglect the AF itself and talk more about your stuff and less about their stuff. Um, you might be spending more time talking about the disad. And while it's obviously important to be talking about those things, it's still important that you're addressing the affirmative case and responding to their arguments, even if you're less familiar with them. Um, I wanna move on and talk a little bit about cross-sex strategies, because I know that sometimes when you're debating an AF that's, un <coughs> excuse me, debating an AF that's unfamiliar, um, cross-sex can be a bit daunting. So the first piece of advice I have is don't be afraid to ask clarification questions. I know sometimes in cross-sex, we wanna constantly feel like we're making arguments and we're asking tough questions and putting the other team in a difficult position. But in the context of debating an unfamiliar AF, it's totally okay to be like, 
hey, can you kind of explain how, like the connection between these two arguments or can you explain just like what this organization is and does and why it's important for the F? Um, if that's something that you're not understanding that you think might end up being important in the, in the debate. That's not to just like find a tiny point in the 1AC that you don't understand or the 2AC and be like, can you explain this and just give them all the time in the world to explain a tiny thing. But it's better to understand what is going on than to act like you understand what's going on. Obviously, it's important to have confidence. But at the same time, if you act from the start like you understand the 1AC, um, but you actually don't, it's going to be more evident in your speeches that you don't. So it's better you kind of figure it out early on so that you can give really strong final speeches. Something else that's really helpful um, if you're unsure exactly what the AF does is to just simply ask what the plan does. Um, that's important to make sure you understand since it'll have implications across every part of the debate. So make sure that you understand what the plan is and don't be afraid to ask about it during cross-sex. Something else that is useful to ask about are internal links. So how they get from one, um, one argument to the next on advantages. It's not as um, beneficial to ask questions about impacts. So like if they read an economy advantage, it's, it's less persuasive to be like, why do countries go to war? Or like, why does war cause extinction? Because that can be asked about any position um, and isn't exactly what you're going to be spending most of your time on in your speeches. So it's really most effective to try to poke holes at AF solvency and internal links in your questions by asking them to explain them because those certainly make less sense as like the idea that countries might go to war, go to war since wars have you know happened before. Um, and so I think that that's where you want to spend more of your time, um, just in cross X generally, not even against an unfamiliar AF. And then something that's important that I'll get to a little more in a second is partner communication and collaboration. So while you're asking questions. Um, and you both are trying to figure out what the AF is, it's beneficial for your partner to also continue to kind of read through evidence or um, try to find more specific evidence, um, really working together when one person is, you know, having to ask cross-sex questions or give a speech, that the other person is doing what's necessary to kind of get to a more level playing field to make sure you're understanding what's going on and reading evidence that's as specific as you can um, possibly find. So next, during the debate, it's kind of similar to what I've been describing for what you should do even before the debate and while you're preparing the one and C, um, but it's important for partners to be on the same page. So in NEG debates generally, and hopefully you've heard this before, it's up to the two N and NEG debates to kind of take the lead, to think about strategy and make the calls, um, call the shots and decide kind of what approach you wanna take um, to this debate. Whereas in affirmative debates, it's more up to the two A to be in charge of research and figuring out um, affirmative strategy. But that doesn't mean that the 1N isn't helpful in these debates or debates generally. The 1N, like I said, can be trying to pull evidence um, and preparing whatever position that the 1NR is going to extend. Um, and so make sure that you're communicating with your partners so you're on the same page. Maybe one of you doesn't understand the AF to the same degree, but it's important that you know maybe the 1N can be pointing out things to the 2N like, oh, I think that the plan might actually do this. Um, if you think that it's important for you to communicate about those things. Um, in addition, I said this before, but throughout the debate, not only in the one in C, but also in the block and in the two in R, do not forget about the case. Like I said, it's easy to try to spend more time talking about your things than their things since you don't understand exactly what's going on, but it's still important to extend the arguments from the one in C and point out any kind of logical inconsistencies with the affirmative. Because even if it's new, they're likely going to be, or an unfamiliar, they're likely going to be different issues with it um, that just make, you know, no natural sense or intuitive sense. Um, I understand that in debates where you're unfamiliar with the affirmative, it's difficult to, you know, think about all the different moving parts and how your arguments interact with theirs. But it's still important during these debates to interact with and respond to affirmative arguments. So if they're making really specific no link arguments, using the language that they said for the no link argument and responding to that on the DA, um, is really helpful. Another way that you can very clearly interact with an affirmative is by making turns case arguments on disads. So back to the other example, um, if they are reading an economy advantage and you're reading a disadvantage, say, with a warming impact, talk about how warming is going to make, um, make economic weakness more likely and undermine economic strength and 
even make it more likely countries go to war. So you're turning their advantage. So I think doing things like that makes it very clear that you're interacting with PF, even if you don't have a lot of specific evidence about PF. And also, as I said earlier, while it's important to you know ask clarification questions and sometimes it's okay to not know what's going on and to portray that to a certain extent it's important that no matter how unfamiliar you are with the app and the two and are you project confidence um you you know want to make it clear that you understand what's going on in the debate even if you don't have a ton of evidence about the app maybe you're beating them because they're dropping arguments and um you know that you're going to win the debate so it's important that even if there's a bit of anxiety and concern um you project confidence in the two and are and that leads me to my final slide, if it'll come up. Okay, there it is, which is um, addressing kind of some of the, no, nope, there we go, uh, addressing some of the concerns that you might experience during these debates. So one thing to keep in mind whenever you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't really thought about this AF, I've never debated it, it feels super different, is that it does have to be a topical example of the resolution. So that's the one, you know, beauty about the activity in terms of uh, research is that we know, you know, for example, on the water topic, that when you were going to come to any given debate round, the affirmative might be a bit different, but it was going to be talking about water policy. So, you know, whenever you're arriving at a tournament, that um, they're going to be debating an example of the resolution. So it might be different from the affirmative that you debated in the prior round, but it's still going to relate to water policy on the most recent topic, for example. And you know stuff about the resolution, like you know, you know, recent things that Congress has done pertaining to water policy or the resolution. Um, you know the mechanics of it and some of the topic background. And so keep this in mind in debates where you're like, I don't totally understand exactly what they're talking about is that you do have a lot more information and knowledge that you can draw from than you anticipate. Um, in a, on, on a similar note, um, less in terms of knowledge, more in terms of the evidence and the cards that you're reading, you will have evidence that is responsive in some capacity. Like I said, it might not be specific about what the AF does, but you're likely to have generic links or generic circumvention and solvency takeouts, arguments about how conservative courts won't do the plan and like uphold it um, are all things that you can draw on. And lastly, remember that the other team may be confused too. If it's a really weird affirmative that seems really divorced from the literature on the topic and kind of doesn't make a ton of sense to you, take um, some solace in knowing that the affirmative team, although they may be doing a better job at potentially acting like they understand what's going on, is going to have a certain level of confusion too. None of us are experts here. Um, but I hope that you found some of this information useful. Um, like I said, my email is right there and I would be happy to answer any questions you have and good luck in your debates.